Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's time to get started with our next session. Uh, this one on Taoism. I'm Mark Mullins, and it's a pleasure to chair another session dealing with East Asia, and this time looking at Chinese traditions. And the theme is looking at Taoism. And we have a nice panel here to uh, focus our attention on this tradition. Uh, Vincent Gosa, the uh, specialist on Taoism and Chinese religious social history is our main speaker. And then we have two respondents. I'll introduce them later. Uh, I know he's published widely on social history of Taoism, and I noticed a very interesting most recent book, Making the God Speak, the Ritual Production of Revelation in Chinese History. Uh, I will move and let him sit here and manage his talk. We look forward to your presentation and to the discussions, responses shortly. Thank you. OK, let me put this in full screen. Uh, yes. OK, good. Um, OK, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really Happy to be here with all of you, some old friends, uh, lots of new friends. Um, and of course, I begin by thanking warmly and profusely uh, Professor Cipriani uh, for his uh, organizing this, this is a Herculean task, putting all of this together imagine, brilliantly. And, and also thank you to all the staff and all the people who make this possible. Um, I really enjoy this, not only because it's in beautiful Rome, but also because I, I would never thought I would live to see the day when at an international conference in Europe on religion, Christian churches would get two hours and Taoism would get two hours too. That's a beautiful day. Um, today, uh, so I don't have special announcement to make like uh, uh, Professor Introvigny this, this morning, it's not my birthday. Uh, but today by Chinese calendar, it's the 11th day of the second month, right? Um, and I'm sure there are lots of gods who have their birthday today because when you look closely at Chinese calendars, you have lots of gods every day and you have to celebrate their birthdays, right? But the, probably the most important thing for the topic today is next Monday, so the 15th of the second month, and that's the birthday of Tai Shang Lao Jun, uh, the, uh, the supreme god who incarnated to become Lao Tzu, and uh, according to some actually laid the foundation for the uh, Taoism, which we are going to talk about this, this afternoon. Um, the on the program so the topic is called taoism with a t in my paper is taoism with a d and sometimes we have undergraduate students coming to us and ask professor is it the same thing as two different religions don't worry it's the very same thing if it is a thing um this is because of the uh, the different ways to transliterate chinese into uh latin alphabets and uh, the new uh transliteration called pinyin favors d so no we we tend in in scholarly cycles we tend to write taoism with a d but i okay never mind that's the same thing one last word of caution before i, I get started with my powerpoint presentation is that uh Unlike most of the scholars gathered in this room, I'm not a sociologist. I've been working with sociologists, sociologists in my institute. I have, I've been reading them, of course, uh, but I'm, I'm not a sociologist. I'm an historian, and at the moment, I mostly work on, say, 16th to 19th century uh, Chinese religious history. And for that reason, the way I will approach Taoism might be somewhat different from some of the other papers. And probably one of the most uh, salient differences is that I will not be using quantitative data. Not because I don't like quantitative approaches. In fact, I do. And in, in my own historical work, I try to, to build um, you know, uh, quantitative data sets whenever I can. But for the purpose at hand today, I don't really see very reliable and useful quantitative data that I could draw on to make the points that I want to make. And, and we had earlier 
uh, this this morning a presentation on surveys and uh, on on Chinese religious practices today. So that probably give you an, an idea of what is available and also the limits of that kind of data in the current Chinese context, right? So um, Taoism. Uh, I'll start with, and I'm going to talk about definitions for a while. I'm not going to spend 400 pages on this, but I think we uh, need to spend a, a moment trying to um, agree on what we are talking about when we talk about Taoism, because this is it's not only an academic exercise. It's, it's actually a very uh, salient political question. It, it has been a salient political question in the Chinese world for at least a century. What is Taoism? What is not Taoism? And this has very real consequences for real people in the field, right? Uh, because Taoism has managed, and that was not a given, <laughs> uh, managed to be recognized by a successive modern Chinese state as a legitimate religion. Being a Taoist means being granted some sort of um, uh, legal legitimate space to practice religion uh, that people who are not don't have access to, right? So this is a very real question. Um, so I start with my briefly with my definition, so you get a sense of what I'm, I'm uh, trying to uh, aim at. Uh, but this is only valid for my own research and for our discussion today. So I, I define that as the imagined community because there is no overarching institution that would uh, have authority or gather or communicate with all people uh, de defined as Taoist. Uh, people and communities who engage or at least aspire to engage or are committed to engage to two interrelated practices, and it was, was mentioned this morning, self-cultivation for oneself and ritual for others might be two different kind of religious practices, but I think in all religious tradition, and certainly in the case of Taoism, they are very closely uh, interrelated. Uh, so self-cultivation means aiming at what I call transcendence. I certainly agree that the, the, the term can be, uh, uh, the, the appropriateness of the term can be debated, but by this I mean becoming uh, an, an immortal or a gen gen, which I translate as a transcendent person, that is a person who is not dependent on anything other than oneself for its eternal existence. Right? Does not and is not affected by time and space. That's what I call it, transcendence. And ritual salvation for the community of, of the dead and the living. You can uh, tr ritually transform dead people into immortals. It's actually quite common. Um, and the living, so healing people, uh, 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 practicing exorcism, and restoring moral order. Taoists have in common to see a moral order in a world that is being compromised by all kinds of spirit and evil um, beings that uh, properly trained Taoists can deal with and expel in a bureaucratic mode. And all of this is based in, on Chinese language revelation. And I really insist on the three and the, the, the two elements of that term, Chinese language. Taoism is intrinsically, in, uh, very intimately linked to the Chinese language, to its, its structure, its, its logic, its phonology. Very, of course, you can, we can translate Taoist text, but very, very few. Uh, in, including very seminal, fundamental Taoist scriptures that are performed every day in temples have been translated into any other language. Um, so Chinese language and revelations, the gods speak to us according to Taoists, and they have been doing so since the beginning of the uh, universe, and they keep doing so to this very day, right? And so it's an open revelation and ever continuing revelation, uh, uh, tradition of revelations from the first millennium of the common era to the present. In the name of the pure uncreated gods that have been part of the universe since, uh, I mean, ever since the universe came into being, uh, and, and are emanations of the Tao, which is the uh, ultimate form of the universe, and who speak to ordinary humans through various means. Okay, that's my definition. There are many more uh, definitions and I'm not going to list all of them, but I, I would like to mention a few which are important. The first one, of course, is the political definition. Now in the, in the PRC, in the People's Republic of China, 
which is by a very far the largest part of the Chinese world. Um, there is one legitimate uh, organization uh, representing and managing uh, Taoism, Taoist and Taoist practices and temples and places, which is the, the Dao Jiao Xiehui, the, the, the National Patriotic Association of, of, of Taoism. Uh, and they have their own definition of what Taoism is, of course, and they are uh, actually empowered by the state to, to provide and enforce that definition. And this is a rather, uh, let's say, narrow definition when compared to some others, including the one I just mentioned, because it's explicit, one of its explicit purposes is purging Taoism of a whole set of superstitions, Mishin, which is the order of religion in, in the modern uh, Chinese classification system, of course, inherited uh, from the West through Japanese language. And that means that a, a, a large array of Taoist rituals and practices that were very common uh, and until the 20th century, are not no uh, are, cannot be performed in official Taoist temples. They're illegal. They are considered not part of proper Taoism, right? So we have a political definition. Uh, something which I we discussed with my uh, uh, colleague anthropologist David Palmer in that book, The Religious Question: Modern China. And this definition is worked within the triangle, defined and enforced within the triangle. So I mentioned the. Uh, the, the clerics running the Taoist Association, the state officials, especially in the uh, Religious Affairs Bureau, and the academics, which are also part of that. Our Chinese colleagues in, in Chinese universities teaching religion are, uh, are also trained, uh, half that's part of their job description, they train clerics. Um, and so they are in very close cooperation with the, uh, the, the, the Taoist temples and, the, and the, uh, the members of the Taoist Association. Okay, there are also some uh, purist uh, definitions. Uh, basically, they, uh, and some of my colleagues in the Western academia uh, cling to that definition, saying Taoism really, that's the heavenly master church, which was created in the second century of the common era, established the, f the, the, the fundamentals of what is still today uh, Taoist ritual practice, and he said that's Taoism, and and every, everything else that claims to be Taoist is just a new religious movement that claims to be Taoism. And according to some of those academics, those new Taoist movements, which uh, new religious movements, sorry, which are not really Taoist, actually include the monastic order, uh, which is the mainstream of the Taoist association today, the Chen Chen, right? So we have very different definitions that are being, you know, promoted by all kinds of people who are actually in position of authority to define Taoism. Um, we have a scriptural definition. We have a Taoist canon. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Taoist canon in a moment. It's the imperially authorized and sponsored collections of Taoist texts. Uh, the last edition we have, uh, 1445, uh, about 1,500 different books in it, and some of those books run to tens of thousands of pages. It's a very uh, large, substantial canon. And its purpose at the time was really to do just that, to define what Taoism is and is not. If it's in the canon, it's Taoist. If it's not in the canon, it's not Taoist. Right? Uh, so it's maybe as good as any other definition of what Taoism is. The problem is that the last canon is already like six, almost 600 years old, and a lot of revelation have occurred since then. So this might have been a very good definition by the 15th century, maybe less so in the 21st. And of course, we have all of those people who say that whoever claims to be a Taoist is a Taoist. That's fine. But I, I, I see many problems with that kind of uh, approach. And I, I, I tend to have a more uh, substantive definition of, of, of Taoism. Um, there are lots of debates around these definitions in terms of the relation of Taoism as we choose to define it and some other things whose definitions are uh, also uh, problematic. Uh, the first one is that all the local vernacular ritual tradition, by vernacular we really mean vernacular language, lots of local traditions that uh, maybe sometimes don't have written uh, scriptures or, or manuals that are really perf performed for local gods in the local languages. You know, China is, Chinese world is very large and there is one common language which used to be called the language of the officials, Guanhua, now it's called Putonghua, common language 
but in actual day-to-day uh, uh, -day life, people speak local languages, right? And so you have the elite tradition in the uh, uh, standard uh, Mandarin uh, Chinese language, and you have the local tradition. And whether all of those local traditions, even though they refer to the Taoist gods and Taoist traditions, are they Taoist or not, that's a, a, a topic for endless debates. Uh, even more debated is the question of popular religion or folk religion or whatever term you would like to use and whether it's part of not of Taoism. Um, I, we could debate this for hours, I'm not going to, but it's a major question and again it's an important question because it's just not uh, an issue for academics to debate around the table. Uh, if local temples manage to get recognized as Taoism, it means they have legitimate identity. They have uh, they are legitimate in the in the eyes of the local state, right? They can raise funds, they can you know uh, rent lands and and so on and so forth. If they have not, then because it's not. Well, it's more complicated than that because in some places of uh, some parts of uh, uh, PRC, no, you can open and run a temple and get it recognized as part of popular faith, you know, not popular religion, popular faith, Minjian Xinyo. But that's not uh, the case everywhere. It's very complicated. So it, this has real implications. Right? And, uh, and the Taoists themselves are, don't agree on that. Uh, you have some elite priests who think that what's going on in the local temples has nothing to do with their pure elite uh, religion based on scripture, on meditation, on esoteric ritual, and that what the uh, the old ladies you know go uh, do when they go pray to their local you know snake spirits. That's nothing to do with them. But when you go to those temples, you see actual Taoists performing rituals for them. So Taoism is present there in those so-called uh, popular religious sites. Um, there are many ways we can, uh, you know, resolve this, this uh, answer this, this question. But this is a debate that not just for us, but a deep debate going on between Taoists and in, and, and in the field in China. And the most uh, complex, uh, a tricky issue, certainly even more complex than the local uh, ritual tradition and the local cults is the question of the so-called redemptive societies. Redemptive societies is a term that we scholars have coined about 20 years ago to describe the whole set of new religious groups that appeared in China uh, beginning in the uh, early 20th century that were the heirs of the earlier uh, messianic um, so-called sectarian movements, but that g managed to uh, be recognized by the Republican state and that adopted all kinds of uh, orga organizational features uh, from Christian and Buddhist organizations, so mass organization, uh, membership cards, uh, annual fees, uh, 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 journals, magazines, radio stations, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, missionaries going abroad, and so on and so forth. Very large organizations, some of the largest, Tongshan Shi, Dao Yuan, etc., got tens of millions of members. And one of them, a rather late comer, but a, an instant success in the 30s and 40s, called Iguan Dao, was the largest religious organization in China by the time the communists took over in 49. And it was the first most pressing task of the Chinese government is purging Iguandao, and it was done on a massive scale. So it's still completely illegal in the PRC today, but it's one of the largest uh, transnational Chinese uh, religious organizations based in Taiwan now, but it has branches everywhere, including Roma, Paris, Geneva, Berlin, and so on and so forth. Um, the relationship, because this is politically extremely sensitive, the connections of those groups with Taoism is a major problem because at the time, of course, there was a strong connection. These uh, uh, redemptive societies funded Taoist temples, they organized Taoist rituals, they taught and, and mass disseminated Taoist self-cultivation techniques, right? So connections are very close and you see uh, uh, text written in the 10, 20s and 30s saying now the mainstream of Taoism is those new religious groups, right? That sort of take 
the Taoist teachings to an, in, in, in a new form, in a new era. But saying so now is the kiss of death for uh, any cleric. So it's impossible to say, right? So we have these major issues that loom very large in the minds of people in China and those of us who study Taoism, but which cannot be discussed openly in China. Of course, in, in, in Taiwan and other places, discussion is much more open. Okay, so lots of complicated issues around definitions, but I'll move on uh, to say that um, these the various definitions we are used to reinvent by, to fuel various projects of reinventing Taoism in the 20th century, and we still see some of those projects uh, going on. Uh, one of them in the official uh, patriotic association of the Taoist association, but some other project as well. And what uh, these people say in people promoting that kind of reinvention project basically say that Taoism uh, by the uh, uh, 19th century, by the end of the uh, uh, imperial era in Chinese history, was in a state of uh, advanced decline, and that project of reinvention were needed to reinvent, to renew Taoism and to make it alive again, right? And so this is a discourse that we find everywhere among the clerics and among the academic works on Taoism written today. So it's sort of a, a meta-narrative that is everywhere, but I think which we need to take critically. Um, so what was really in decline, what was not, what kind of, what were the implication of this uh, top-down renewal project? Uh, certainly, the, uh, the the political status of Taoism had declined to some extent, but we still had the heavenly master, the every the so-called Taoist pope. That's the term that uh, uh, many uh, Western visitors used in, in in China in the late 19th and early 20th century. So, of course, Pradeshan missionary were using the term in a very derogative sense. But we also find people of uh, Catholic. Uh, culture, belonging, using the term in a more neutral way. But anyway, uh, these were this was a family that basically had a monopolistic right to grant ordination titles to humans and to grant uh, um, uh, canonization titles for the dead to become gods. And this person was still an official with the imperial state in 1911, his rank in the imperial bureaucracy has been, uh, you know, going down to some degree. But he was still part. Taoism was still part of the imperial state, and 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 this was completely uh, dismissed by the uh, uh, republican regime after 1912. Right. So it, there was certainly a, a, a drop in the political standing of Taoism that the leaders of the Taoist Association, tr first in the republican period and then the patriotic. Taoist Association, established in 1957, tried to re-establish, re-engage, and regain a political status with the state. Um, pop did popular participation uh, decline in the uh, modern period? That's certainly far from sure. That's what the uh, proponents of the uh, of the uh, uh, decline and renewal discourse claim but we don't have any hard evidence for that. And one of the other things they, they claim, they say that by the uh, end of the 19th century, Taoism was moribund. It was not uh, creative anymore. There was no uh, new uh, doctrine or, or uh, in interesting uh, uh, you know, theological or religious writing being being done. And, and then again, that's, that's not a fact. That's a claim that they advance but uh, as we'll see, this fact actually ignored the largest part of the textual production of Taoism in the modern and contemporary period, which is done through spread writing. That is not living Taoist writing uh, uh, for themselves, but inviting the gods to write for them. Um, and so uh, a few more words about spirit writing, not only because this is what I'm working on now, but also because it's a... Uh, uh, it's a, the major source for the Taoist text circulating in, in modern contemporary Chinese societies. And it's also a very good example of what I mentioned a moment ago, which is the kind of rituals that were at the core of lived, real practice Taoism in the, uh, up to the early 20th century, and which got banned by 
the uh, uh, the PRC, right? Spirit writing is illegal in China now. It's practiced in a good number of places, but you know, in a very discreet way, um, and it's it's openly practiced in all kind of places. And this is a small spirit writing temp shrine in an apartment building in Hong Kong, uh, and there are hundreds of those uh, places like this in in Hong Kong alone. Um, so. This core element of Taoist practice, I mean, uh, opening the, the channels for you know ongoing revelation and discussions with the gods, which was the core of Taoist creativ creativity and textual production, uh, was is no uh, we, is something that cannot be performed in public and that cannot easily be dis even discussed in academic circles in China today. Right? So we have sort of an iceberg. The largest part is below the uh, sea level. It's invisible, but it's there. Um, yeah, so Chinese terms for spirit writing since 11th century. Spirit writing is deeply eschatological, is about God's warning humans of the impending apocalypse and how to save themselves individually and collectively before it's too late. And of course, the eschatological and prophetical nature of spirit writing is one major reason why it is banned uh, by the uh, by the PRC, right? And it also allows uh, members to become gods themselves. It's really part of a self-divinization uh, project. Um, okay, so the next part of my presentation is about uh, well, maybe engaging with some of the arguments we had earlier this morning, which is how to think about what uh, is the place of Taoism and uh, within the, 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 the larger Chinese religious landscape, right? So as we have just said, there are five political, uh, politically uh, recognized religion, and we have all kind of other um, terms that define whatever does not fit in in, in those uh, five uh, uh, official religions, and that's what uh, Yang Feng Gong calls the, uh, the 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 gray market of uh, Chinese religion. And within that, so who counts as a Taoist, right? And uh, as this was, it's quite similar to the situation uh, of Confucianism, which we discussed this morning. Very few people claim to be uh, Taoists. But actually, this has an even uh, a longer history than the problem of identifying oneself with Confucianism, because historically, even many centuries ago, mostly ordained priests would call themselves Taoists, but ordinary people would not. Because there is no point in that. There is no social benefit. You don't claim to be a Taoist if you have not been ordained as a priest. But then that doesn't mean that you are not using, uh, I mean, praying to the Taoist gods, going to Taoist temples, and using Taoist ritual services. And, and the key tenets um, uh, propounded by, by people who claim to be Taoist is the moral retribution of acts, you know, Evil is punished because there is a moral order of the universe. Evil is punished and, 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 and goodness is rewarded. That's something which is also common to the all Chinese religious culture, including Buddhism and Confucianism. And what Taoists do is ritual communication with the gods, but Buddhists and Confucians also do that. So who is Taoist? Um, one interesting fact is looking from the contemporary situation is that we see little, I don't say we don't see that at all, but we see little uh, in the way of confessionalization that we have for Chinese Buddhism quite a lot. Uh, Chinese Buddhists have been doing that for the whole 20th century, confronted with the same situation as the Taoists, saying, you know, you need to modernize, you need to be a modern religion and to uh, get rid of superstition. So the Buddhists say, okay, we, Buddhist reformers, Buddhist institutional leaders basically said, okay, we'll stop basically being uh, first and foremost funeral uh, uh, services providers. We're going to propound an ethical vo worldview and we're going to severe the links with, you know, so-called popular religion and local cults and local gods and spirits and that kind of things, right? So we're going to focus on the teachings of the Buddha, morality, um, 
meditation on that, that kind of things. And therefore, Buddhists should be Buddhist only. They should stop going to other temples and should stop doing spirit writing and that kind of things. Many continue to do that, of course, but the discourse is we need to confessionalize. And as a process, and that echoes what we heard about Japan this morning, they invented Buddhist weddings in the 20th century, which we never had before. It's just, it was, did not exist. The wedding is a confession ritual, um, traditionally. Uh, and so they have manuals for living a Buddhist life, eating Buddhist, marrying Buddhists, uh, educating your children in the Buddhist way, and so on and so forth, right? So confessionalization. The, the institution pushes people to say, either we are Buddhist and we do everything in the Buddhist way and in the Buddhist way only, or you're not Buddhist. We see very little of that in, in, in the context of Taoism. Some attempts, of course, trying to copy and mimic the Buddhist, but that does not, I've not gone very far at all. Um, so little uh, attempts to confessionalize and to create Taoist as a particular kind of class of people, right? So Taoism is still sort of nowhere and everywhere. And, uh, and Taoists still cling to the idea of religion, uh, division of religious labor. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. And so all of this um, leads us to uh, ask once again the question of how do we deal with this uh, 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 religious diversity or plurality in the, in the Chinese context. And the way I use these terms is that there is plurality, uh, there is uh, there is the diversity, of course, as there is everywhere, different kinds of religious outlooks and practices. There is plurality in the sense that these various religious practices are recognized and have a legitimate space, but there is no, historically, and still not to, to the present, at least not in the PRC, uh, Taiwan and other places are different. There is no pluralism in the sense that the door is open to newcomers. There are several religious traditions, but they each, uh, but the, uh, what they can do is regulated. We have a very high level, both historically and, and, and still today, lots of not only state regulation laws, but more, I think more importantly, local regulation about what is possible. We have lots of temples, a lot of gods, but that doesn't mean you're free to build a temple and enshrine a new god if you want to. All of this is regulated and negotiated. Okay. Um, and so to understand the way this uh, plurality, which is not pluralism, works, uh, basically all of us try to elaborate theoretical models, and we've heard about other models this, this uh, morning with Anna Soon, and I'm going to give you my own, and of course all of those different theoretical models are to a large extent compatible and maybe uh, even rephrasing or different perspective on basically the same ideas. But that's how I deal with this and try to understand the place of Taoism in that larger framework. Uh, so I used two tools and I didn't invent that. That, that. that was already used by other scholars, but I found them very useful. Uh, the first one is what I call the four dimensions of individual and social lives. So I'm looking at the, the level of individuals. The first one, well, the first three actually are ascriptive. It's uh, dimensions of, of your life that you have not chosen to live into, but you have to. So first, the territory and space. Right? You live somewhere, you're part of a territorial community. And so traditionally, uh, people living in a given temple territory belong to that temple as quite similar to uh, what Mark uh, discussed this morning about the, the Jinja, the, the Shinto shrines, the same idea. You're part of a village, then you have to contribute to the village temple because that the god of the village temple protects the, protects the, the, uh, the territory and all the, the registered inhabitants in that territory. Um, that used to be something extremely strong. I mean, that most Chinese temples were temples of that kind. There are other kinds of temples, but that's the... Uh, the uh, the building the most important building block of Chinese society is those territorial communities with their uh, territorial god. The second dimension so space, time, history, and so ancestors to so the cult of ancestors. And then there is the economy. You have a profession, then you belong to the guild of that profession and worship the same pattern of that particular guild, right? 
Um, and here I'm talking about Chinese societies as it worked until the uh, the 1910s and 20s, and I'm going to talk about uh, contemporary changes in a, in a short moment. But here you have three dimensions of life that you don't choose. You live somewhere, you have to, you don't need, necessarily need to attend the ritual, but you have to, to contribute financially to them. And you also have to uh, uh, worship your ancestors. There is absolutely no choice in that. And same for the same patterns. And then on top of that, you have the voluntary dimension. And that's where, you know, families, the, the basic unit in the force, in a, at least territory and affiliation dimension, that's the family, not the individual. Right? And of course, there are gender roles. Right? But people are there as members of a family. And then people as individuals make their own choice. And then you have all kind of things. If you feel very Buddhist, then you can join a Buddhist association and do meditation and sutra chanting and, and you know raise donations for the monasteries and all that kind of things. If you're more Taoist, you might join a group that will do spirit writing or practice uh, internal alchemy or that kind of things or organize Taoist rituals and so on and so forth. Right? The very large array of choices and a, a very vibrant world of all kind of religious groups that were developing. But that was a dimension that did not contradict, that's just a different dimension from people, what people had to do as a member of a local community, a family or lineage, and a profession. So why is this idea of the four dimension useful? Because we can see, looking at institutions uh, like temples and places and, and, and uh, associations and so on and so forth, uh, through the four dimension that explains why there were actually very little competition, both historically and to the present day, between temples. You have large villages or neighborhoods can have dozens of temples, but they don't compete to each other because they serve different purposes according to those these different dimensions. In many uh, traditional villages, you have the ancestor all and next to it a temple for the territorial god. And they don't compete for resources because people have to contribute to both, right? Because they, they, they serve complementary purposes. They serve different niches. And that's why the, the idea of a religious ecology is uh, uh, useful to understand that kind of arrangement. Uh, it also shows various aspects of the individual religious life, right? So some of the rituals people engage in is as part of the family, right? All the family is there to worship the ancestor. But then at certain moment, the... Uh, um, the wife can go and join the Buddhist group, the husband can join uh, a, a group that is organizing charity or doing you know, medical uh, uh, work for the poor, and then some other member of the family might be a member of a Taoist group and so on and so forth, right? And also these different dimensions have at different levels of secular secularization during the 20th century. The, the professions, the guild, were the first and the fastest to secularize. Basically, by the 1930s, all the guilds have been transformed into professional association and basically get rid of their temples and the icons of their uh, patron saints, and they have stopped organizing massive uh, Taoist ritual for their patron saints. Some continued a bit later, but basically it happened in the space of 20 years, which is really fast. Uh, by contrast... Uh, the other levels secularized uh, less rapidly. There is still ancestor worship. And there is still the idea that people belong to a territory. And even though they have moved to the city to get a job in the city, they are still registered in the temple where they were of the village where they were born. And they would go back there regularly. And then when they die, the family has to go back to the temple of the village and then announce the death to the gods of the village because he is the one who is keeping the records. Right. And so this, the, the territory is much, the, the space, the soil, the ground is much less uh, secularized than some other dimensions of social life, such as the economy. Uh, there is also the liturgical framework, which uh, is another way of, a um, complementary way of looking at this diversity, what I call li liturgical framework, which I take from the work of Kenneth Dean with a major scholar we have already mentioned this, this morning is to look at uh, framework as uh, traditions with specialists, with institutions, temples, scriptures, and so on and so forth, but are ways of arranging elements, places, people, 
gods, icons, objects, sounds, affects in a particular configuration. And another framework can use the very same thing, but arrange them differently, right? So in one village, if you have today is the uh, the day when we worship the ancestor, then the ancestor are central stage and the Confucian priest are the one performing uh, for them. And the other parts of local society are there, but like on 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 the sides, right? And if the next day is the the birthday of the Buddha, then it becomes arranged. The same elements are arranged in the Buddhist way, right? But the elements are the same. The arrangement is different. So it's different liturgical frameworks. This, by the way, is a picture of uh, this lady, a member of. Just to show you an image of a Taoist ritual quickly. Um, so the, the guy in a beautiful uh, green robe is the Taoist priest in a major temple that's near Suzhou, and the lady uh, is the, uh, the the head of the uh, the association of a village, and the village has come, the whole village has come to that temple to perform a ritual to renew the alliance between the, the living member of the village, the god of the village, and the high Taoist gods, and so she's carrying the official written uh, 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 memoir that the Taoist has written on behalf of the village members to the high Taoist god to uh, ask for the renewal of this alliance. Right? And so this is placing village people, uh, village leaders, priests, place in a, in a, in a Taoist configuration. That's, that's a Taoist framework. But you will find the same people in a range uh, uh, along other frameworks the next day or the next month. right? And so there are lots of liturgical frameworks uh, operating in Chinese society. So the Buddhists, the Taoists, the Confucians, the storytellers, absolutely essential in many parts of, uh, you cannot do a ritual without them. The spirit mediums, that's the most common, actually that's the bedrock of Chinese society and religion. The mediums who, let, uh, who are possessed by the gods and who let the gods speak through them. Uh, they are everywhere. They were always illegal, and therefore they have become really good over the centuries and millennium of going under the radar, and they are still there, and they are doing very well today. The sect, so-called sectarian tradition, and then some newcomers, Christianity, Islam, and, and, and new religious movements. Okay. And so looking through that particular glass, we, uh, we see so Chinese uh, social religious life a range uh, uh, around these different dimensions and, 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 and put in order in different frameworks, uh, we can see affinities between specific frameworks and specific dimensions, right? And so the Taoists are very closely linked to the territory and the economy. And because uh, the, 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 the pattern saints of the, uh, the professions were mostly Taoist gods. And so the uh, uh, very rapid uh, secularization of the, 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 the guilds during the 20th century is one of the many reasons why the place of Taoism and the visibility of Taoism in Chinese social life has changed to an important extent. Uh, but for the territory, they are still there. The Confucians, of course, especially associated with filiation and history, they are the ones who write history. And the Buddhists with uh, uh, voluntary associations and filiation as well. Um, and all of this suggests that there is a division of religious laborers. Different specialists do different things that people need. And in fact, there is a strong propensity in Chinese society, uh, and that can be seen in, the, in over the very long duration. But it's still the case today, I think, maybe to a lesser extent than a century ago, but still a propensity to curtail competitions. Uh, there is. We often read this, this idea that you know, the Chinese they try everything and they, uh, you know, they are they're ready to you know deal with any religious specialist as long as it, as it works. That's not quite true uh, because the access of ritual services are regulated, and we have lots of local regulation that tell you very precisely who has the right to perform what ritual, where, and for whom, and for, and for what price. Right? So, uh, and, and the idea of those regulations is that they limit competition, because the Chinese uh, are aware that there are problems with competition in, in terms of social tensions. Right? Uh, and so one of the way they limited, historically limited uh, competition was a system of parish. Again, quite similar to what we see in Tokugawa, Japan. In, in, in the region where I've been doing fieldwork in Jiangdan, basically around Shanghai and Suzhou, if you like. 
there was a uh, until the 1930s, there was a system of parishes. Each family has its own Buddhist priest, its own Taoist priest, its own Confucian priest. I know not everyone likes the expression Confucian priest, but that's what they are, uh, performing Confucian rituals. Their own spirit medium, their own uh, unclean, uh, un, uh, low caste people, you know, uh, helping with funerals and that kind of things. And, and on a contract that ran for generations, right? And they were not allowed to say, I don't like the way my Taoist, you know, sings. I'm going to hire someone else with a better voice. But if you do that, your Taoist can sue you in court and win, right? So, so much for, you know, unfettered competition and, and free for all. And all of these things were regulated. One of the first things the nationalist first and communist then did was dismantle the system in the name of free market and competition. Isn't that lovely? Um, but so the system has been largely dismantled, but we still see traces of them and the logic is still there. People trying to sign long-term contracts with their providers of ritual services. And, and each family needs several kinds of uh, ritual service providers. Um, I see I have about 20 seconds left. So I'm going to have to skip all of this. So, uh, by the way, so, some of this was not in the paper, <laughs> as I'm sure Maurizio and, and Jacopo has already realized, but I, I wanted to uh, mention this to give some sort of background. Um, so we don't need to talk too much about organization, but basically when I to talked earlier about the, 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 uh, the, the, the discourse of decline and renewal, the idea of dismantling all of those regulation and this division of labor in the name of confessionalization and established you know, a freer uh, religious market was endorsed by Taoists, among other religious leaders, and saying that the problem with Taoism what is, was weakly organized and it needed a stronger organization in the form of a national association. Uh, but, but actually, when... The, uh, the Taoist Association has not been very spectacularly effective in enforcing its uh, project of unifying and standardizing practice over the uh, 20th and 21st century. And in fact, we, it's, it's possible to see, and some Taoists would say this way, of course, uh, when the, the microphones are turned off, saying that their organization is weak is actually a good thing because it allows them to continue operating under the radar of the state as they have been doing for many centuries, right? So the, uh, the numbers we have, the uh, registered clergy, Taoist clergy is not very large, several tens, maybe 50, 60,000 uh, uh, Taoist priests uh, in the country as a whole. But of course, there are many, many more which have managed so far to escape registration. Same thing for temples. Most temples with Taoist gods and, and uh, inviting Taoists to perform the, uh, rituals for them on a very regular basis are not registered as Taoists because they are uh, advantageous to such a registration, but they are also drawbacks. Okay. Um, Okay, I want to yeah, mention Taoist studies in China and the West, which is come, uh, started very, very late. That's a Taoist, huge Taoist canon I mentioned earlier. The, the first edition, accessible edition we have is published in, in uh, 1925, one century ago. And the first description of it, the first guide to the Taoist canon was published uh, two, uh, 2004. 20 years ago, right? So it's uh, Taoist studies are, are late comer in the field of religious studies, uh, and um, it has no. Uh, there is no Taoist university. There is no, very little support anywhere, either in, in in China or Japan or Europe or North America. Uh, so we're in a, in a very weak position. We don't have uh, endowed chairs like Buddhist studies have a lot. Um, so it's a sort of weakness. But just like for organization, it, this also gives us uh, freedom to explore. And there are many ways in which Taoist studies are vibrant and innovative, uh, including in uh, methodology and, and, and theoretical insights, the way more established things maybe are not. Uh, last thing, and I know I'm already a little bit beyond schedule, but 
because you also mentioned this this morning. I was very happy to hear that. Uh, so what is the what are kind of presence of Taoism in Chinese societies today? So we see a rather limited uh, organizational presence. Institutions are not very strong, not very rich, not very powerful or politically or socially uh, influential. But that does not mean Taoism is declining or is not there. It is there, but it's there in other ways. And one of the important ways Taoist remains very present in Chinese society and culture is popular culture. So I was really happy we had this, started this discussion this morning talking about Japan and talking about popular culture, the kind of things that I, I think academics in the humanities don't look at enough, really enough. Uh, but the things that are the stuff of life for most of the people around us, including for our children. Um, yeah, movies, uh, animes, uh, video games, all that kind of things. And it would be less pessimistic that uh, 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 Mark and Erika were this morning about the impact of popular culture, because it's, of course, it does not re-socialize young people into going to temples or doing ritual. It does not do that, that's for sure. But it transmits a certain vision of the world, certain mental possibilities that would not be transmitted otherwise. And this has actually already occurred one or two generations before, when we interviewed Taoists in the 90s and early uh, 2000s, saying, why uh, back in the 80s and 90s did you want to become a Taoist priest? And they did not say, because of my family, or because I believe in Lao Tzu, or because I read this or that. They said, no, because of the Hong Kong Kung Fu movies. You have this Taoist priest who could fly and, and, and you know, slay dragons. That's what I want to be. And I heard that often, a lot. And I think the same thing is happening again today through video games and animes and that kind of things. This vision of the world, this vision of possibilities that Taoism opens, Taoist practice opens, is maintained alive. The, the, the whole traditional cosmology, right? Thinking in terms of you know, five phases, yin, yang, that kind of thing. That is transmitted through these media. And I think they play an important role. Popular culture and holy sites. They are all these such holy mountains, grottoes, springs, river, lakes, hills, all that kind of places everywhere in China. And they are all sacred. And people don't you know, destroy them if they can help it. The government does. People, local people protect them. And it's always associated. They are always a shrine, even if it's not very conspicuous, but to a Taoist god. And this is always associated with Taoism. Because again, Taoism is that, that dimension of Chinese social life, right? It's the territory, the place. And so these holy places are still places where people talk about Taoism and connect to Taoist traditions. Um, and this maybe I should uh, keep for uh, Q&A. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much and for bearing with my being over talkative. So thank you, Professor Mullins, for the presentation, and thank you for having me here. I'm very, very happy to uh, share with you the, all these um, days of uh, intellectual uh, uh, discourse and dialogue. And uh, so thank you also to Professor Cipriani. Uh, so I'll set my clock so I have a reference. Um, so apparently, China is a sacred place. <laughs> No, right? It's not uh, as atheist as uh, people uh, say it is. So, <clears throat> um, I want to start from uh, Vincent Goussard's definition of Taoism because I think it is very interesting both for what it states and for what it omits. Uh, so, what focuses on and what it doesn't focus on. Uh, it describes Taoism as an imagined community of people and social groups who strive to engage in self-cultivation and liturgy, aiming at personal transcendence and salvation of the social body. So this definition mentions so social construction and discourse, the imagined community, observable practices, self-cultivation, liturgy, you know, so something more like objective in a sense, uh, and sociological ends. It is noteworthy that uh, Vincent Goussard did, uh, does not mention some elements that we might otherwise expect in the description of a religion, a specific doctrine, a founding figure, and a, a, an authoritative textual corpus. Today, 
<clears throat> so I will not discuss the doctrinal part because it will be very take maybe most of the time. But um, instead, I want to say that if uh, I have interpreted uh, Professor Gustard's um, idea correctly, uh, definition correctly, uh, the other two aspects, uh, so uh, the uh, absence of a founding figure in, in, in the definition and of a textual corpus, um, are not missing because of the lack of a founder or scriptures, of course, but uh, precisely because, on the contrary, Taoism boasts many founders and has a, a countless text. This must be attributed to the fact that uh, throughout its history, a series of new traditions were added to Taoism, each one with its own divine and human patriarchs, and I, I might add matriarchs too, because uh, female goddesses too are very important, and contributing to uh, and contributing distinctive pantheons, liturgies, and scriptures. As a consequence, the origin of Taoism cannot be attributed to a single founder, nor can its scriptural canon ever be considered complete. Uh, I would argue that two, the, the two characteristics uh, two characteristics allow the Taoism to be constantly open to innovation and uh, to have such a flexible development and uh, its cosmology and its reliance on revelations. Um, the, basic, the basics of the Taoist cosmology uh, are established uh, in chapter 42 of the Tao Te Ching, which uh, very famously states that the Tao generates the one, the one, the two, two the two, the three, and the three uh, generates all entities. And this means that the totality of reality itself, including the gods and supernatural beings, is permeated by the Tao and is in fact a manifestation of the original primordial qi. Uh, that we can translate as pneuma, breath, um, sometimes maybe more uh, problematically even energy. It, and uh, so this primordial qi is, uh, um, itself uh, originates from the Tao. Um, given the protean nature of the, of the Tao and the unfathomableness of the ultimate truth, Taoism possesses an open theology. That's how I call it, at least. A new higher heavens and more effective gods could always be added, and a variety of cosmological and soteriological tenets could uh, continuously be incorporated into the system. The theoretical consequence of this premise is that theoretical consequence is that any religious movement could potential or revelation for that matter could potentially be integrated in Taoism provided that it conform itself to Taoist cosmolo cosmological assumptions or that it could be adapted to, uh, to them. Throughout history, uh, Taoism manifested itself as a revealed religion and uh, Professor Gustav has said uh, a lot about this already. Uh, the first Taoist ecclesia, let's, I can call it like that, the way of the celestial masters, traced its own fun foundational event to the covenant with the powers established by the aforementioned uh, Taishan Laojun, so the divinized Laozi, and the founder of the movement uh, was called Chan Zhang Daoling in the second century. Uh, in the following centuries, other deities belonging to loftier heavens uh, revealed liturgical texts, incantations, and self-cultivation practices uh, to human recipients, promising more effective ways of achieving transcendence or more powerful liturgies to save oneself, one's own relatives, and the whole world. Eventually, that's also very important. Uh, texts played a central position in, Ta in most uh, Taoist revelations, depicted either as uh, instructions directly revealed by manifestations of the Tao or as a, the spontaneous coagulation of a primordial qi. I just mentioned it in the pre-cosmic time. So eventually, and uh, this, this uh, self-coagulated like, uh, scriptures uh, were eventually translated by deities into a language comprehensible to human beings. Either way, we could interpret so, such revelations as the way in which the Tao progressively revealed itself to humanity, and in, in certain way also to the gods themselves, because this process of revelation happened also in, in the heavens, not, not only uh, in the world. I suspect that uh, uh, this is because, uh, it is because of these characteristics that scholars found troubles in defining the boundaries of Taoism, as attested by the series of definitions listed by Vassan Gussard, 
uh, to which others could be added because there are actually many other <laughs> definitions. <laughs> That's, uh, so in, in, uh, in what terms uh, can we talk of a Taoist religion today? I, my personal understanding is that uh, when we think about Taoism, we are referring to an institutional religion. Uh, if scholars attempt to determine whether a phenomenon is or is not representative of Taoism or some, in some way connected to it, uh, they do so with reference to what historically has been an institutional religion. Most generally by institutional, uh, I mean a religion that establishes roles and rules, but specifically in this case, uh, it points to the existence of a clergy or class of ritual specialists, a textual corp uh, corpus and liturgy and uh, doctrine. Uh, so where do these come from? As Professor Goussard said, uh, uh, the roots of Taoism lie in the antiquity, even Han cult of, of, the, of Han culture, so even pre-imperial times, but its development has been so, com and its devel development has been very complex. It's like uh, I imagine, in, uh, picture it as a, a series of layers added uh, one on top of the other, but that layers that, that could periodically be recovered you know, throughout history and so resurface and maybe be reworked. And so it's, uh, it's a, a very, it's layered, but not in a simplistic way, in a, in a straightforward way. Uh, instrumental for the develop, um, development uh, and maturation of, Tao, of the Taoist project, a, a project uh, of cultural integration, um, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Gusan uh, wrote, uh, were the elite and the state Starting uh, from the way of the celestial masters in the second and third century, passing through the presentation of a prototypical Taoist canon in 471 to the uh, sovereign, and uh, until the development of two great, uh, the two great and imperially sponsored, also imperially sponsored traditions, uh, the Chenzhen and the Zhongyi, uh, imperial uh, recognition has been instrumental for di directing the way in which Taoism developed. Um, it was only, um, so, so this is not to dismiss the local and uh, popular contribution to Taoism at all. In fact, I would uh, go so far as to argue that until the 18th century, all innovations in Taoism were in some sense developed unofficially and not necessarily within even the elite circles. Uh, and only later accepted and systematized or rejected by the court, of course, when the imperial and when the empire collapsed, this legitimatory like, structure even came to an end, so things changed a little bit. But uh, um, I, still today, state recognition and support continue to influence the development of Taoism. For example, by including it among the five officially recognized religions as a form of, both of legitimation and control, uh, and, uh, for example, uh, pressure, uh, in this way, pressuring temples, local temples dedicated to local gods to seek official recognition under the Taoist umbrella. And, uh, or maybe even by controlling the sources of revenue of temples, so how temples can sustain themselves. Uh, or by promoting, in, in, and in this case, indirectly, uh, by promoting uh, the urbanization and economic development of China or, or certain areas of, of China with the consequent social disruption and the loss of ground at the local level in, and in the countryside, which is where uh, Taoism is more prosperous. And in a certain way, I, 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 this reminds me of a Shinto uh, case we discussed this morning. Um, and in another way in which a state indirectly at least uh, uh, influences uh, the development of Taoism is through the Taoist associations that we, uh, the Professor Gosar discussed previ previously. If Taoism is an institutional religion, how do we make sense of the fact that it is, it is temples devoted to local gods that employ Taoist ritual masters, that most of the Chinese world is Taoist, um, and uh, Professor Gusat would, uh, I think, uh, uh, argue by means of practice rather than belief or explicit subscription. And uh, that at the, at the same time, defining someone a Taoist only uh, made sense and still in part only does make sense, make sense in relation to ordained practitioners. 
I contend that these appear to be problematic statements only if we approach them by means of what are potentially inadequate definitions of religion. I suggest that at least within this area of research, it is more fruitful to deal with religion as something that people do rather than people think of or believe in. This has little to do with the well-known debate, or in uh, Sinology at least, over whether orthopraxy fa was favored over orthodoxy in the process of standardization of Chinese culture, but has much to do with a reassessment of the metho methodological foundations of the study of Chinese religion. Um, and then I, I, today I decided very selfishly to uh, take uh, advantage of the fact that we, ha we have so many uh, renowned sociologists to uh, discuss my approach, if theoretical approach, to uh, study Taoism, and uh, maybe might not necessarily be correct, but uh, I hope it makes sense at least, and I would love to hear your, your ideas about this. So I will, I will take a step back from Taoism and focus on more theoretical issues to the best of my abilities. I will briefly shift the topic of my discussion from religions in the sense of uh, social ways of doing religion with those observable outcomes to religion, if such a thing exists, uh, of course, and to its uh, high level of internalization. Uh, in this regard, I, I found uh, the works of both Peter Berger and Robert Bella very helpful to solve some of the issues I just highlighted. Peter Berger noticed that society is a world-building enterprise characterized by an ordering, nomizing activity. And within culture, he defined religion as a human enterprise by which a sacred cosmos is established, whereby something, anything in fact, can be bestowed upon the quality of a sacred sacredness. And he added that the sacred cosmos is confronted by man as an immensely powerful reality other than himself. But more importantly for our case is that uh, this reality addresses itself to him and locates his life in an ultimately meaningful order, and I stress meaningful order. This, I think, is an interesting and more fruitful approach to religion. Uh, uh, a little more than 10 years ago, Ro Robert Bella discussed religion, referring to Abraham Maslow's concept of big cognition, a union of subject and object, a wholeness that uh, overcomes partiality and to the inescapable hunger for meaning in human beings. I would suggest that this sense of meaning is not purely, or should, necess should not necessarily be uh, purely a perception or a feeling, um, but that it can uh, uh, express itself in more systematic and articulated ways that include, for example, system of values. Meaning can certainly be conveyed discurs discursively, but also uh, performatively, and ultimately there is no reason, in my opinion, that why it cannot merge cognitive and emotional knowledge. This concept, concept of religion as uh, the process of meaning building or inextricably tied to, to it and to a personal system of meaning has been recently developed also in the field of psychology of religion, and most notably by Raymond Paluzian and Crystal Park. My perspective on this is that religion can be studied qua religion in the sense of an internalized process whereby a cosmos or worldview or meaningful order is built through practice and in the sense of religions uh, as a culturally specific and contextual manifestation of what I just said. So Taoism therefore would be an institutionalized and culturally specific way of building a cosmos. I think that this approach casts new light on Vassan Goussard's claim that Taoism function, functioned as a liturgical framework, providing a coherent cosmological system. Uh, and I, I'm here quoting a little bit from uh, your uh, um, original uh, paper. Providing uh, a co coherent cosmological system uh, in which uh, local traditions could be recognized and coexist, that it uh, primarily takes the form of communal ritual a communal ritual giving order and meaning to local society, so order and meaning to local society. Liturgy is the means by which the Taoist coherent cosmology is being objectivized for anybody to witness, perform, and interiorize. This approach is also extremely helpful for discussing Chinese religion in general and Taoism specifically while avoiding controversial categories, or what I would define controversial categories. This is why conceptualizing adherence to Taoism in terms of belief or personal allegiance is not particularly significant, 
as uh, it seems we have uh, agreed upon today, whereas focusing on practice and on the pervasiveness of Taoism in popular culture appears to yield better results from an academic standpoint. And Taoism does not command exclusivity, as we have seen within the Chinese religious environment, and so an individual can potentially avail herself of a Taoist ritual specialist one day and go to a Buddhist temple the next one. Then I, ha I found, this, I did some net netnography, as uh, it's called today, and uh, uh, some interesting uh, discussions in Chinese forums, but uh, we don't have time to, to, to discuss them. Although this syncretism uh, might uh, be ascribable to a peculiar, like historical, cultural, anthropological predisposition to religious pluralism of the Chinese civilization, there, might, there are many instances in which history and contemporary society, Chinese history, uh, history and contemporary society in which pluralism was and is clearly rejected. Another way of thinking about the pre-Republican religious environment is by referencing to what Guzard calls Chinese religion. Um, and then quote from, uh, from him, characterized by diversity, one with an ordering center of gravity, the religious political state, or as John Lagerway, another scholar, uh, famous scholar of uh, Taoism calls it, the Chinese state church. The myriads, uh, and uh, I'm still quoting from Gusard, uh, the myriads of autonomous groups that form the social basis of Chinese religion, uh, each chose from among a shared repertoire of beliefs and practices those services, and I, I, I highlight services, offered by clerics of the three teachings, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, that served their needs. End of quote. This broader framework of Chinese religion was the result of centuries of doctrinal debates, attempts at centralized systematization, coexistence, and co-practice at local level, and at times gave, ri gave rise to contested coexistence. Different modalities for building a cosmos operated within a broader and more enco encompassing cosmology that imperfectly accommodated all of them, and which is the so-called Chinese religion. Um, this is why, still today, it is not always viable to quantitatively determine religious affiliation in China. Um, and then uh, I think, uh, so even when a service to de uh, do detect religious affiliation, this depends on, I think this is a, a point we should uh, um, evaluate. So even when the service do detect religious affiliations to, uh, today, uh, the idea of a religious affiliation might depend on the increasing influence of the exogen exogenous concept of religion in Chinese society. That's something I don't have time to go into detail now, but it's, uh, I think, an interesting point uh, to discuss. So, uh, finally, a couple of uh, things. Uh, one is about the liturgical language, um, about liturgy, specifically liturgical language. Professor Gosal said it's very important language in liturgy. Uh, and, uh, my, and this consideration is related to the internationalization of Taoism. So throughout the modern and pre-modern and modern history of Taoism, its texts were composed in Chinese, including the large number of liturgical manual and scriptures. A few considerations will uh, reveal the implications of this. First, we must remember that Taoist scriptures are revealed texts, most of all at least, as discussed above. A second, uh, based on the bureaucratic metaphor, which is a little bit controversial, but I would say generally wise, still employable category. Uh, Taoist priests communicate with the gods by means of petitions that historically had to be carefully penned in order to be effective. Given the cosmological and liturgical significance of Chinese written language for Taoism, a genuine question is whether Taoism can render itself independent from it. In other words, if whether it is a translatable religion, uh, in the same way as Christianity and Buddhism are. Um, so far, only Taoism-inspired self-cultivation practices have been successfully exported abroad, both in Asia and uh, in uh, other continents. But uh, they do not have the same radical bond with Chinese written language as liturgy does. So a second question, therefore, would be, um, and maybe I can directly ask you, um, can international Taoism without its liturgy still can be considered Taoism? Uh, and if so, what are the implications for our understanding of liturgy as a fundamental part of Taoism? 
Finally, uh, one aspect that deserves to be discussed is the use of new technologies and of mass media uh, by the Taoist community. Even though no, not many studies have been conducted on this topic that I am aware of, at least, uh, I can still make a few considerations. Uh, the wide exploration of the use of new technology, uh, new technologies in the Buddhist context has already highlighted a, high set, um, a set of uh, interesting phenomena, such as the use of website and mobile applications for communication with practitioners and for providing services and digital spaces for donating, worshiping, confession, Telematics allows the uh, practitioner to always have at hand such services and to easily be connected with the world of the so-called online bodhisattvas. Although Taoism is present and thriving on the cyberspace with web pages, with chat groups, uh, social media accounts, large Taoist institutions that to the best of my knowledge have yet to exploit information technologies at, at a comparable level especially within the uh, PRC, but there are some interesting instances in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Still, there are many, actually, there are many examples of individuals, uh, ordained individuals, merging the roles of uh, ordained Taoists and influencers uh, with interesting results. And the, really the last point is uh, that contemporary academic research should also study if and how the new technologies are changing the, the, the economic patterns of Taoist temples, so the way they collect fundings, for example. And the so-called entrepreneurial temples, by means of these tools, can now, could now reach a far larger number of potential supporters and consequently tap on a previously unavailable amount of resources of donations. One way in which these institutions might attract investments is directly through charismatic monks and the priests dedicated to cultivating their own social persona as much as their own self and their liturgical proficiency, or more directly uh, by offering devotional and liturgical services online, even using uh, mobile applications as uh, I discussed above. Then there would be another huge topic about the commercialization of Taoism, which I thought about listening yesterday about Islam, but uh, it's also a topic we don't have time to discuss today. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I wish to, to say thank to Professor Cipriani for inviting me to this International Forum on Religions. And I will try to offer some reflections stimulated by Vincent Gosser, very interesting uh, contribution. I will mainly focus on some points relating to the opening and just one closing parts of his speech. Certainly, Taoism has not received the attention given to Buddhism in the West for reasons Gosser alluded, alluded to in his speech. However, what Christopher Schipper called the living Chinese tradition, with an eloquent reference to Taoism's simultaneously pervasive and unifying character, has nonetheless been the subject of countless attempts at interpretation and divulgation, not only by academics, but also by the variegated galaxy that expresses itself on the internet. A point that deserves to be emphasized, not just to justify the inaccuracies and shortcomings of this little commentary of mine, is the relative youthfulness of Western studies on Taoism, uh, the development of which, with a few pioneering exceptions, can only be dated to after World War, World War II. The deepening of the study of sources, especially of Taoist scriptures, and more generally of historical sources and of field research aimed at the study of liturgical and social aspects, have led to, to repeat a statement by Jean-François Billeter, the surfacing of a continent in the space of a few decades. In opening his talk, uh, I'm sorry to, re to repeat the, the citation <laughs> made by uh, Jacopo too, Professor Gosser proposes his own definition of Taoism with the caveat that this is only one of many definitions proposed by scholars. Taoism is understood by him as an imagined community recognizable by two interrelated practices. Self-cultivation for individuals, which aims at the state of transcendence 
and union with the Tao, and salvation rituals for the social body formed by the dead and the living, which grant health, drive out demons, and restore moral orders. Both, both of these practices are, in his view, based on written revelations that have appeared from the first millennium BC to the present day. Uh, our first problematic point I would like to raise here, without having the slightest claim to its resolution, is why are there different definitions of Taoism? Is it our hermeneutical inadequacy or an objective, so to speak, difficulty inherent in the written oral sources themselves and or the visible manifestations of Taoism? Center, certainly, Professor Gossert is right when he says that the question of definition is not a secondary point as it determines the activity of the institutional body called the Chinese Taoist Association in China especially when it comes to providing patents of orthodoxy to certain religious phenomena or practices within a general context of control by political power. This attitude on the part of the CTA may be due to modern historical events themselves, to the impact not only political but cultural in, in its broadest sense of modernity, which has not infrequently made the work of institutional Taoism difficult in its fun functions of controlling and channeling the local cultic phenomenologies of the so-called popular religion, but has maintained the secular relationship between political power, <clears throat> once imperial, now an expression of the party, and representatives of the Taoist elite. Returning to Professor Gosser's definition, he speaks of the interrelated practices of individual self-cultivation and salvation rituals practiced by Taoist masters for the social body. Uh, perhaps herein lies one of the problematic points involving the very definition of Taoism as a religion. Undoubtedly, the distinction once common among scholars between an original philosophical Taoism as expressed in test dating back to the pre-imperial period, such as the Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching, and large part of the Zhuangzi, and the religious and communitarian Taoism, which would have originated with the current of the celestial masters in the second century CE, has now been relegated to the conceptual attic of the sinological laboratory. The in-depth study of the above mentioned classical sources and others, such as the Neye and other sections of the text known as Guanzi, and the discovery of new manuscript sources have led to the recognition in them of some elements that scarcely fit the modern definition of philosophy, and that can be considered as evidence of techniques of meditation and inner refinement, in a word of rejoining the Tao. Can we therefore recognize a religious character to such self-cultivation practices and historically how to frame them, especially in their historical phase of formation? In my opinion, the risk is to project onto antiquity the reality, all too evident today in its most common expressions, of the, in, on the internet and elsewhere, of practices based at best on learning and possibly understanding written sources, at worst, on attending distance courses in spirituality. One should not forget the fundamental role that from the earliest times, doctrinal transmission has played in such practices, expressed through orality and then the handing down of scriptures. In this regard, the importance of the sacred test, revealed or not, in Taoism is framed in a civilization such as the Chinese, which from the very beginning placed great value on writing as a sign and the bridge to sacredness. However, the undoubted historical phenomenon of the imperial patronage of the great collection of Taoist text, text of which the Tao Zhang, uh, the Taoist canon, is but the most striking example, 
and thus their circulation and dissemination must not make us forget that the canonical Dai scripture themselves, not to mention the text of ritual praxis transmitted from master to disciple, in a word, the scriptural corpus of the various Taoist forms that have emerged over the centuries have never, never been the subject of uh, indiscriminate universal circulation. In order to avoid uh, introducing a dualistic in the interpretation between an individual religious expression, such as self-cultivation practices, and a communitarian and social religious expression, such a as a liturgical and ritual forms, and to deepen the uh, conception of the two as interrelated practices. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we must consider this point. Uh, the first point maybe is also uh, about the, 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 the question, who is Taoist? Uh, the value of scriptures for the recognition of a theoretical orthodoxy and orthopraxy has not historically implied uh, a universal dissemination. Even in the pre-modern period, the indispensable point in the definition of Tausch has remained the connection to a human and doctrinal lineage, which more often than not is rooted in a revelation and or a defied progenitor. Unlike the religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, literacy implied in these religions in the greater or lesser ability to read and understand a sacred text such as the Bible does not make one Taoist any more than it makes Taoist one who, as part of the social body, body enjoys the ritual performed by Taoist masters. The ritual content does not see participation in an in an assimilative sense uh, uh, by the community. I want to be more precise about this. There are not Taoist sacraments uh, that the community accesses in order to confirm their participation in a Taoist church. On this aspect, an, an exception, on the effectiveness of which, however, I would refer to Professor Gosser, much more informed observations, may be the historical phenomenon of the theocracy, theocracy initially established by the celestial masters in Sichuan. Obviously, I am referring, referring here to the concept of sacraments as it is exposed in Christian church. The term is used for Taoism by some famous authors as anaseidel, but with a meaning near to the Greek symbolon with regard to revealed scriptures, talisman or seals, sacred objects that are not disseminated or share, shared by the social body. On the practices of self-cultivation, which are a distinctive, a very rich aspect in Taoism, I would like to recall uh, another one, another point much debated, which fits well into the theme of this forum, the label of mysticism, a term that belongs to a different context of civilization. I certainly do not, not have space here to delve into the, this issue, which revolves around the problem. Can we attribute the term mostly associated with a passive phenomenology of an ecstatic nature to practices that insist on a path or realization of the Tao, whose stages, which are the subject of textual practical transmission, are controlled by the practitioner? The active character of such methods has been emphasized by some scholars like Lafargue and Roth. The primary difference lies in the repetibility of the sacred experience, or rather, to be more precise, in the permanent character of the level of realization attained by the practitioner, which seems to be at odds with the transient character independent of individual will of the ecstatic experience associated with mysticism. Similarities could instead be pointed out with the sphere of the so-called Western Christian speculative mysticism, and even with some forms of the orthodox religious world, such as hesychasm. Uh, 
the function of Taoism as the guarantor of a liturgical framework in which an overlapping, uh, I use uh, uh, the term uh, um, used and cited by Professor Gosser, between the Taoist elite and imperial power historically existed is certainly a true aspect. Uh, in my opinion, in opinion, the nature of the relationship between historical manifestation of Taoism and political power still remains to be uh, thoroughly investigated. Why did the imperial authority, whose very institution was characterized by an evidently sacred character, often adopt ritual forms of legitimizing and protecting power from Taoism? And what are, what are the reasons why Taoism in the very terminological structurings of its pantheon displays obvious bureaucratic aspects drawn from the vocabulary of imperial power? In which direction did the impulse towards this overlapping occur if it is possible to identify a primary direction? And furthermore, are we sure that this overlapping should not in fact be traced back further to the first millennium BC? The theme of power management is not absent in the Tao Te Ching. At Mawantui and Guotien in uh, elite burials, silk and bamboo manuscript dating respectively to second and fourth century BC have been found that can be traced back to the later consolidated the Tao Te Ching. Was the text in its variants used only at that time for its value related to survival longevity practices? Was its possession an indication of more than outward adherence to the doctrine, such as that which appears to be proven in the case, for example, of Empress Do of the Han Dynasty? What relationship existed, for example, in the period of Guotian manuscripts, 4th century BC, between the political elite and the representative of the doctrine expressed in, in them? These are just some of many hermeneutical problems we, we have to, to face uh, uh, still today. I no longer have time to reflect on Professor Gosser's interesting remarks on the relations and possible similarities between Chinese uh, nationalism and some Taoist exponents of today. I only think that in this regard, and also in view of the specif specific operational areas, Confucianism is perhaps the doctrine that has been most suitable in recent years for instrumental use by political power and aligned intellectuals in order to show the existence of an indigenous cultural heritage fully capable of reconciling authoritarian management of power and the construction of an ethos that owes nothing to Western models, even though it can easily flourish in the postmodern world. On Taoism as an ecological religion, however, I can add a few brief remarks. Uh, asking the audience here to accept at face value my assertion here that the equation Taoism ecologism is a modern distortion and that Chinese antiquity is full as is ours of references to occasional, occasional disastrous activities of exploitation of natural resources, I just say that the Chinese Taoist Association has in recent years aligned itself perfectly with the attitude of Chinese institutions, exemplified in the definition of ecological civilization, Shen Tai Wei Ming, a key concept in the speech delivered by CCP Secretary Xi Jinping and the 19th uh, National Party Congress uh, on uh, 18 of October 2017. What is perhaps let, less well known is the extension of this concept that cast interesting lights or shadows on some perhaps unexpected confluences between China and the West on this point. An example of this is the website of the ARC, Alliance of Religions and Conservation, founded in 1995 by Prince Philip of Edinburgh, this international association whose supporters include the World Bank, WWF International, and the governments of Denmark and Norway, I cite, help the world major religions 
to develop their own environmental programs. We help religions to be in contact with major environment, env environmental organizations. Its secretary general was Martin Palmer, an Anglican trained env environmentalist and historian of religions, known in the past for some of his translations of Taoist classics, such as the Zhuangzi, and of some Nestorian Chinese texts. This has been published in a volume entitled The Jesus Sutras, which has as its significant subtitle, Rediscovering the Lost Religion of Taoist Christianity, and has been received with more than a little perplexity by specialists in the field. The ARC partners included the powerful Chinese Office of National Religious Affairs, and the Chinese Taoist Association. Taoism was regarded as a tradition that has always defended man harmony with the natural elements. In 2007, the ARC was invited to give one of the key speeches at the International Tao Te Ching Forum held in Xi'an and Hong Kong. The title of the talk was A Journey of a Thousand Li Begins with a Single Step, uh, a quotation from stanza 64 of the Lao Tse Tao Te Ching. In it, it was stated that the Tao is, at, is under unprecedented, unprecedented attack due to human activity. This disrespectful of the environmental balance in a clear reference to the famous incipit of the Lao Tse, it was emphasized that the way of material prosperity is not the true way. In August 2018, a first draft of the 2019-2025 seven-year plan for environmental protection in the Chinese, Chinese Taoist community was posted on the website. Easier, uh, here, is the introduction. The ecological environment and the welfare of the people are the foundation of the nation future. In recent years, under the leadership of President Xi Jinping, the Chinese government has strategically stepped up the building of an ecological civilization, integrating it into all aspects of economical, political, cultural, and social construction. It has promulgated a series of policies to promote environmental protection for the harmonious development of humankind and nature. In the end of June 2019, the AERC declared its experience closed, having fulfilled the task for which it was formed. Its work is continued by the International Network for Conservation and Religion, e, uh, INCR, officially founded in September 2019, to spreading the growing awareness of the existence of a spiritual link between environmental consciousness and well-being. And by Faith Invest, I cite, an international non-profit organization that support faiths to invest in line with their values for the benefit of people and planet. We believe this will help to achieve a just and sustainable world. Palmer is always president and interim CEO of Faith Invest. On 31 January 2022, the British newspaper The Sun published a news article. The headlines were Chinese intelligence officers infiltrated a charity set up by the late Prince Philip. According to the article, Chinese spy uh, teamed up with Faith Invest to gain access to His Royal Highness the Prince Philip. I cite, Chinese intelligence officers infiltrated the charity set up by, by the late Prince Philip. They wheedled their way into Faith Invest to conduct operations and buy influence. Agents teamed up with the charity to meet the Duke of Edinburgh at Windsor Castle. The agents joined the forces, forces with Faith Invest and last sent a delegation to the palace in 2017. Articles seem to suggest that Chinese intelligence agents have been operating through the China 
Taoist association. Fate Invest condemned the story, stressing that Fate Invest was not set up by Prince Philip. It did not even exist at the time of the 2017 visit to Buckingham Palace mentioned in the Sun story. The charity through which representatives of the China Taoist Association met Prince Philip in 2017 was the Alliance of Religions and Conservation, founded by Prince Philip and Martin Palmer, now founding president and interim CEO of Fate Invest. In fact, Fate Invest has never taken a delegation of any visitors to the palace. This was uh, the reaction of Martin Palmer. Frankly, I find it lovable that Taoist religious leaders who have spent years studying their faith at Taoist temples are described as agents of the Chinese state. It doesn't seem a very efficient way of organizing your spying. It is true that all religious groups, groups in China fall under a government ministry called the United World Front Department. They don't have any choice in the matter. Since the 8th century AD, all religious institutions in China have officially come under a government ministry because the Chinese government knows that faiths can be both a great driver of social cohesion and engagement and also a source of opposition and dissent. And that tension remains today. But my experience of working with the China Taoist Association is that they are exactly what they say they are, Taoist religious leaders who have led the way in China when it, when it comes to faiths taking action on the environment. I leave all reflection about all this history to you. In the impossibility of drawing firm conclusion on this matter, I do, however, agree with Paul Goldin, uh, expressed by an article of, um, uh, written in 2005, according to whom the ecological agenda that currently makes use of Taoist thought appropriated the past through a conscious falsification for, purposed, for a purpose that has to do solely with the present. As to the nature of such aims, the consonance between international organizations such as the ARC or Faith Invest and Chinese political and religious institutions may be merely temporary. The former clearly follow an objective that goes beyond the Chinese horizon, whose features seem to evoke a kind of holistic spirituality of a syncretistic type that is not new to the West. One need only recall Teilhard de Chardin concept of the noosphere and Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. The latter have nationalistic Taoism as Chinese wisdom, and strategic aspects as the protection of Taoist sacred sites as a reflection of the centuries-old balance between center and periphery, in full conformity with current leadership guidelines. Thank you. I'd like to thank the discussants. I haven't been a good timekeeper, but that's because I went over myself this morning and it's very hard to call people to shorten things. Uh, but I think we're already into coffee break time, but I'd like to give Vincent uh, a chance to at least comment briefly and then perhaps pursue individual questions over the coffee break so that we don't delay the program. Vincent, final response? Thank you. <clears throat> the Taoist value tea time a lot. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be really brief, but I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, Jacopo and Maurizio for having read the, the paper and engaged with it and, and, and came with your own uh, perspective. There, there is a lot in, in, in both comments and I, I, I can't I go through all of uh, the points now. So may very briefly one point Jacopo uh, raised and one Mauricio raised. 
for Jacopo is um, I think it's, maybe that was your last question. Is international Taoism without ritual still Taoist? Uh, well, I don't think it's a question for us to decide. For these people, it is obviously. Um, yeah, the question of internationalization of, of Taoism, that's one of the things I have to skip, but it's both an asset and a liability for Taoism. Uh, a liability because um, international connections have been very useful for some other religious tradition to gain a foothold and to carve a certain space for themselves. Like for Buddhists, the ability of connecting with the Buddhist world in, in, in Korea and Japan, Southeast Asia and India and other places and, and, and being a channel for Buddhist diplomacy, which has been something quite important in, in, in some cases and throughout the Mao years and still now, exchange of relics and that kind of things. Uh, the Buddhists have, have been very good at playing that card and then using that for their own benefit. Um, Taoists, no. Uh, there is a, the particular question of connection with Hong Kong and, and Taiwan, where Taoists play a role, especially with Hong Kong. That's important, but that's a different question. You know, for, for the Chinese government, this is not an international question. Um, and so they are uh, Western adepts of Taoism. As you, both of you know that extremely well, maybe for the audience. They are Westerners who went to China and trained with Taoist masters and even a few Taoist masters went to the West and established centers and, and, and you know, uh, not many at all, a few. Uh, so they are Taoist Westerners and they have set up Taoist association. There's one in Italy and one in France and UK, Belgium, and other Switzerland, other places. There's a, a temple which had opened uh, a few years ago in, in Switzerland. Very beautiful place, by the way. Um, all of this is really nice. It's really small scale. It's a little bit larger in the US, but still, I mean, it, it's a small corner of the religious landscape in, in the US. And, and so these people have gone to the Taoist Association in China saying, we, you know, can the, uh, the Italian or the French Taoist Association and Chinese Taoist Association, you know, create links and that kind of things. And if some of the Taoists there were quite welcoming. They were really enjoyed this, you know, international exposure and they welcomed them and they invited them to training sessions and things. Uh, but this is still, it's, it's a very, very small part of the story and, and, and of the way the Taoist Association tries to build its own autonomy and capacity to do things. It's really nothing to compare with the, 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 the Christian and the Muslim and Buddhist Association. So somehow it's a liability. The Taoists cannot use the international connections to gain power, benefits, resources. But on the other hand, in the current context of, you know, signification of religion, and being able to do as they do every time they have an occasion, that is, at, at every single first sentence of any speech, they say, uh, yeah, the Taoism, which is born in China and developed in China. <laughs> so they try to play the nativist card, uh, but that's a very tricky game, right? Uh, and I can see how some Taoists, not all of them by any means, and probably not most of them, but some Taoists, are tempted to play that game and say, you know, this is, that was a mess. in any way, it's nothing to do with foreigners. They can't get it. And they should not even try. It's not their religion. It's, it's, it's an ethnic. They're trying to, to build that into an ethnic religion um, and, and try to curry favor with the current government by using that very strong... Uh, uh, aggressive sometimes uh, uh, cultural nationalism uh, card. And I think that there's a danger, and we can see a precedence of that in the history of how the appeal of, you know, political power drew some Taoists into playing, uh, going down a slippery slope, and it all ended very badly for all parties involved. Right? And so I can see that the, the temptation and danger for some Taoist right now. Um, 
So actually, that was not answering the, the, the question. So answering the question about maybe, maybe it's not so much the lack of reach order problem. If they, okay, if they say we have not been trained reach order, we cannot do reach order, but ideally that would be part of what we do. I think that's still fine for, you know, qualifying according to my definition. I think the, the, the larger problem was uh, the question of retribution and moral order. If they see Taoism as a set of body techniques, of techniques of the self, that is unmoored from a moral vision of the universe, then I think that's not Taoist, because the Taoist canon, Taoist text throughout the centuries and millennium, is full of, and I think quite unanimous rejection of that. If you cultivate yourself, don't care for others, then that's not Taoist. Uh, so I think the main thing is that. And among the Western Taoists, I think we can see both kinds. We, uh, my friend David Palmer has this nice recent co-author books with Elijah Tiger, who worked on Taoism in the US, and Day Tripper on American Taoists who go to China, and he was with them, and he observed the interaction. It's a fascinating book. I recommend it strongly. And, and this question is there. I mean, some of them, they say, okay, Taoism, I mean, the Taoists are great. They, they can teach us, you know, techniques to be more sexually powerful. And some of, us, of those same group of uh, Western Taoists said, no, Taoism is also about loving others, about nature, about harmony. And I've, I think we might classify these two types of Western uh, Taoists in different boxes, if we want to put them into boxes, maybe, probably we shouldn't. Um, Mauricio, yeah, the environment, and that's an, an error of my point. It's, again, a resource, something the Taoists can draw on, because it's a fact that we have early Taoist texts, like the 180 precepts, probably second, third century CE, that really say, don't go into the mountains and you know, kill animals, don't don't uh, shoot animals, don't uproot uh, uh, trees, don't cut trees, uh, don't go uh, climb the trees to, to you know, take uh, eggs from the nest, don't pollute rivers, and so on and so forth. But, so they have a resource, and, and, and they have been maintaining the uh, circuit mountains, which had uh, bans on hunting, fishing, cutting trees, and so on and so forth. So they have real arguments to do that. The, the question is, what do they do with that? And of course, the, the whole reading of these ancient texts as ecology is wrong. We absolutely agree with that, uh, because it was about preserving life. It was not about preserving habitats and environment. It was about preserving life, not killing. That's different. It's not contrary, but it's different. But now the problem is that we still, can still make reasonable claims. They say, we have been thinking about those things, trees, plants, rivers, for centuries. The problem is, that what do they do with that now? If what they do is just say, yeah, we support presidency's uh, vision of an ecological uh, civilization, then I think they, they are probably wasting their resources. But if you inject that into project, actual project, then that's very different. But I don't see them running projects so far, not because they don't want to, but because of financial and organizational limits. Buddhists do that actually much more effectively. So I'll stop at that. We need to bring this to a close. Thank our panel for rich presentations and please pursue them with questions during the break. We're way over time. Thank you all very much.